was to receive the word of God today as the oracle of the God. Lord, to speak to our heart, Lord, to minister, Lord, to be surrendered to you, that we might minister in your direction.
worship you. I believe it's not because of what we've done, because of who he is in our lives, because of what he has done, because of who he is. Hallelujah. Join us today as we sing our first song, I am a friend of God. Praise God. Amen. Praise Hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. Amen. If you know it, clap your hands. Amen.
Good morning, church. I just wanted to share that in our ladies' fellowship over the last two sessions, we talked about obedience and sacrifice. Now, these two qualities are very necessary for a successful and healthy relationship with our God. Now, the sacrifice that God requires is one that is birthed of obedience, out of an obedient heart. Amen. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. As an example of this, when there is no obedience, yet we come to the Lord and we offer him a sacrifice of praise through our worship, through our giving, through our praise or through our prayer. But deep inside our life, we are being disobedient to the Lord. Then this is not pleasing to God. Amen. That is why God says obedience is better than sacrifice. God would rather our obedience than, obedience than any other outward signs of sacrifice and worship. Obedience itself is a sacrifice that is pleasing to the Lord. The act of a sacrifice is validated and backed up by what we are doing to please the Lord in our obedience to him. This is why obedience and sacrifice go hand. Our sacrifice is backed up by our obedience. It proves that we know the will of God and we humble ourselves in order to do it. Praise the Lord. Um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says that by the renewal of our mind, we are to discern what is the will of God. God. When we discern the will of God and then do it, that, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, then this in itself becomes a sacrifice presented holy and acceptable to God. As an example, we look in the book of Genesis and we hear the story of two brothers, Cain and Abel. Brothers came to the Lord and they wanted to offer a sacrifice unto God. God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but he didn't accept Cain's. He refused Cain's sacrifice. And when we look and study into Cain's sacrifice, some people say it was a lack of a blood offering. Others say he didn't give his best. But what the Bible states, it says that there was sin at the door. Therefore, we know that Cain was not walking according to God's ways, and therefore God did not accept his sacrifice. What we need to make sure is that when we read the word of God, that we live the word of God. We don't just read and then, and then do our own thing, but we read and do the word. We live the word of God. And when we do that and come to God in a time of our need, when we need to pray, we need to ask God for intervention. We need to seek God's face that he will hear and accept our sacrifice of prayer. Or when we go before him, for him and worship him or praise him, you know, singing praises and worship unto him, that it will be a sweet smelling savor unto our God. Amen. We want our praise and our worship to go up. When we give alms, when we give um, to the poor, or when we tithe, that God would take it as a sacrifice to be accepted. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's be diligent. Let's read the word of God and be doers of the word. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Good evening, everybody. This is Sunday night Bible College coming from you for my live from my room, and um, <laughs> we're doing the diploma course at the moment, and uh, we're just doing our last lessons tonight with um, our dear pastors, um, Brother Don's uh, mentor, Brother Paul, and um, at the end of this recording, we'll you'll have a we'll have a short recording just to see what we are learning. So. I'd like to introduce you to our students tonight. We have Sister Mika, Brother JV, and Brother Yay. Alec. Hi, Hi, everybody. God bless Hi. you. Too. I hope everybody's <laughs> safe and I hope everybody's, um, you know, being be in the Word and still with God. And um, remember, He's still on the throne. So, you know, you know this, 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 this thing will not start for, will last forever. So um, we're thinking of you. We, we pray for you. and. Just asking you to keep strong and, and uh, God bless you all. Good night, everybody. See you soon. God bless. Bye-bye. God bless. See you guys.
Christian has an ethical responsibility is, of course, his responsibility to God. And the responsibility to God is to live his life and our life, if you want to put ourselves in the first person here, live our life to please uh, God and live as Jesus Christ. Uh, we see that in Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 27 and also in Ephesians 1, 22, uh, he says that the church is the body of Christ. And if it is the body of Christ, Christ is the head of that body, as we've seen. Uh, then we are to live our lives as members of the body and paying careful attention to our responsibility to God to live as Jesus Christ lived. In Corinthians 12, 27, uh, it says, Now ye are, are the body of Christ and members in particular. Verse 28 said, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps governments and diversities of tongues. Now, Jesus is no longer here in person or in body, but he is here in his spirit. His spirit had came back on the day of Pentecost, filled all the assembly, each, each one individually, and corporately, uh, all of those that are filled with the spirit then become the body of Jesus Christ. And a great big part uh, of the Christian ethic is, is that which the Christian is in representing Jesus Christ on the earth. Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth, ye are the light of the earth. Uh, and, and he asked us as his disciples to walk in the world for him. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're part of this small group study of God's plan and God's promises for seven key areas of your life. Now, in the next seven sessions, we're going to be looking at God's promises for your spiritual health, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, your relational health, your financial health, and your vocational health. I call these the seven key areas of life. Now, God cares about every area of your life, and he wants to bless you in every area of your life. He wants you to be healthy in body and in soul and in spirit, and he has given us the steps and the principles in his word that we can take to live healthy, fulfilling lives, not just for our happiness, but ultimately for God's happiness and for his glory. So let's just start with the habit number one. If I want to be spiritually healthy, number one, I must love Jesus supremely. I must love Jesus supremely. That's a habit. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus says this, if you want to be my followers, you must love me more than you love your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your brothers and sisters. Yes, more than your own life. Now that sounds pretty radical, but he says, otherwise than that, you cannot be my disciple. Habit number two, you might write this down. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must meet with him, that's God, daily. I must meet with him daily. It could just be five minutes a day or 10 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever, but you make a date with God. You get alone with God and you just sit there and you be quiet and you say, God, is there anything you want to say to me? And as you talk to God in prayer about the things that are on your mind, then you let God talk to you through his word. That's, that's worship. And that's a quiet time. Again, it doesn't have to be long but it does have to be habitual. You need to check in with God. Now here's habit number three for spiritual health. If I wanna be spiritually healthy, I must study and do his word. I just can't study it, I've gotta study and do his word. Now there are so many promises in the Bible where God says if you get this book, the Bible, you get this book into your heart and into your mind, he says, I will bless your business, I will bless your family, I will bless your health. I will bless your finances. If you get this book into you and into every area of your life, wherever you want God to bless, you need to build it on the Bible. Psalm 1 says this, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. By the way, what is the law of the Lord? It's this, it's the Bible. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now here's the fourth habit for spiritual health. It involves not your time, it involves your money. Over and over in scripture, the Bible says this, if I want to be spiritually healthy, I need to tithe my income. Now, what in the world does that mean, tithe my income? 
It means that just like I give the first part of my day back to God, I give the first part of my money back to God. I, I, what I, 10% of what I give goes back to God. In other words, if I make $10, I, I give a dollar back to God. Why, why in the world would I do that? Why would God ask me to do that? Well, God obviously doesn't need my money. But he wants what it represents. He wants my heart. And the Bible says where your treasure is, your heart is. Now, I'll have more to say about that in our session on financial health. Because I give God my tithe, my talent, my time. I give him every year of my life. Now, let's move on. Habit number five for spiritual health is this. It's a big one. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must learn to love other believers. Remember when we started off, we said God says life's all about love? Well, God doesn't want you to just love him. He wants you to love other believers. Jesus said it like this. If you're going to be my disciple, you can't just love me. You have to love everybody in my family. Here's what he said in John 13. If you have love for one another, he's talking about other believers, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Habit number six for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I need to learn to serve others unselfishly. Now, service is an important part of your spiritual health and development. Because God says to grow, it's not all taken in. You've got to be given back. You've got to use those muscles that God gives you. You've got to develop your strength. And God says if you want to be the most important person in the room, then you need to take the last place in the room, and be the servant of everybody. The way to be great is by service. Now, finally, let me give you habit number seven for spiritual health. If I want to be spiritually healthy, I must pass on the good news. In other words, what I've been given, I've got to give to other people. I've got to tell others the good news about Jesus. I've got to tell others that there's a purpose for their life, that they, they can be forgiven. That their past can be forgiven, they can have a purpose for living, they can have a home in heaven. You know, when the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said this. Take the teaching that you heard from me, that I, I proclaimed in the presence of many witnesses, and I want you to entrust what you heard from me to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. Now, I want you to notice there are four generations in that verse. Paul says, God gave me the good news. And then, Timothy, I pass it on to you. That's second generation. He said, now, Timothy, you're to pass it on to other people. That's third generation, who are reliable enough to pass it on to a fourth generation. See, the fact is, you're going to heaven because somebody told you. And somebody told the somebody who told you. And somebody told the somebody who told the somebody who told you. Here's the question. Very important question. Is the chain going to break with you? Is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? Are you going to end the chain? Somebody told somebody who told somebody who told you. Have you told anybody? This is the seventh spiritual habit. You see, Christianity is always one generation away from just dying. If you don't tell somebody, then who is going to tell them? Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's take a look at the announcements. Just remember to take care of uh, your tithes and offerings. Make sure that you continue with what we began. Amen. Especially uh, church tithes and any charities that you may have made commitments to, whether it's to foreign missions, home missions, orphanages, um, anything on your heart that you want to bless, you can give it to the church and we'll pass it on. We'll make sure it gets there. Amen. Here's the information for the automatic deposits looking at August we see uh, we're almost finished with the month September is almost here we've got uh, men's online prayer tomorrow night on Monday and we've got all church online prayer next Monday night and we have a revolution youth revival happening this Friday I'll talk more about that in just a second looking at the important dates we have church online until further notice Men's online prayer tomorrow, Revolution Youth Revival Friday, repetition's good, you know. Theological Symposium, end of September, and Lord willing, we'll have our National Youth Camp in person in October. Symposium will be online. 
but the youth camp will be in person. Let's pray that happens. Here's our big announcement. Our youth revival, our revolution youth revival, will be at 7.30 p.m. with our good friend Cole Beebe being our special online preacher. Amen. He visited with us seven years ago, and we had an incredible revival. I thought it was just incredible teaching. Amen. I still have the sermons. If anyone wants those, I can burn them for you. But, uh, in fact, that might be a good warm-up, although you won't have time for me to get it to you. But... If you want those later, let me know. Amen. Cool BB. So Friday night, we invite everybody. Everybody's going to be youth this coming Friday. Look at all these happy adults. Amen. They enjoy it just as much as everybody else. So let's come on Friday night right here on Facebook and join us for Revolution Youth Revival with Brother Cole BB, our special speaker. Now, talking about discipleship, the motto for 2021. Amen. Even though... We're not in church. We are the church. We can still do it. Amen. Point number 14, we can ask someone to test you while you quote a verse from the Bible that you're memorizing. Are you memorizing Bible verses? I certainly hope that you are. And this would be a great way to turn your Bible memory into an evangelism tool. You can hand the verse to your friends and they got to look at it closely while you're quoting it. What a win there, huh? That should definitely open conversation. Number 15, we spoke about this last week. We can take extra Bibles sitting around the house and give one to a friend. Surely, as a Pentecostal, you have 14 Bibles in the house and you only need two or three of those. So take an extra one, give it to a friend, and maybe you guys can read the book of James one chapter at a time and talk about it. I think that would be a really good encouragement to get someone's nose in a Bible and discover how relevant it is. The last uh, one, number 16, a new one. You can even ask a person a question simply, hey, do you ever pray? Just sort of a heart to heart kind of question. You know, ask them if they pray, how often do you pray? Do you think anyone's up there to hear you? And I think that you'll notice that no matter how atheist many people believe they are because they watch all those documentaries which talk about evolution, deep down inside everyone realizes that there's something eternal happening inside our heads here. Amen. Something eternal. And there must be a God who hears prayer. So just talk about that in a positive way. Encourage someone to revive that. And you can talk about your prayer and maybe some answers to prayer. You can share those as well. But this is how we can make disciples of all men just simply sharing our lives in a natural way. You know, these are not bizarre ways. This is not hammering people with Bibles. Amen. It's just sharing the joy that we have in Jesus. Now a recap on last week's sermon, The Seven Virtues from a Wise Man in Israel. I was hoping you were thinking it was Solomon, but it was Cornelius the Centurion that I was talking about. Amen. He was a devout man. He feared God. He gave alms generously, and he prayed always. These are the first four that got God's attention. As you know, nobody gets saved by their deeds, so he said, an angel, and the angel said to go get Peter, who will tell him what he needs to do to be saved. So while he was sending his servant to get Peter, he was busy evangelizing relatives and close friends. Get him in the house. There's going to be an important message coming. He respected the man of God when he showed up. He gave him great reverence and believed what he had to say. And he was eager to hear and do the will of God. So these seven things, if we can follow these seven wonderful virtues from a wise man in Israel, I believe that we will also have a successful Christian walk with God. Amen. So our sermon's coming up. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Don't let that be your life story. Amen. Let's live for Jesus. Amen. So 